Welcome to Philosophy 15. I'm Robert Talese. I'm Scott Aiken. Uh, the point of the podcast is uh, for Scott and I to talk um, unscriptedly about philosophical things. Uh, as you probably know, we are the uh, joint authors of this book, Why We Argue and How We Should, A Guide to Political Disagreement. Um, today, we wanted to talk about a concept that we've appealed to previously uh, on, the, uh, on our uh, series um, in various contexts, in fact, it's come up a couple of times, um, which is a distinction uh, between uh, a first order language or first order vocabulary and a second order language or, voc or vocabulary, what sometimes we might call a meta language. Um, meta languages are languages for talking about the way we talk about something else. <laughs> right. um, and so, um, it seems, once it's put that way, and given the word meta language, it seems like it's just some kind of oddball uh, concern of philosophers. Um, there are such things that are oddball concerns of philosophers. This is not one of them, even though it sounds like it is. Um, that is, meta languages, um, that is these vocabularies we develop for, for talking about the way we talk about other things, is prevalent in our sort of day-to-day -day, uh, guy on the street um, talk. We're constantly talking about how we talk about things. Right. And what makes the idea of a meta language seem so uh, highfalutin and uh, abstract is we don't think about how we talk about the way we talk about other things. Right. Um, and the attempt to explicitly name that phenomenon of talking about the way we talk about other things by giving it the name meta language uh, is an attempt to make us cognizant or to help us be more cognizant of the ways in which we deploy those higher order or second order thoughts um, about our talk. Um, now, given that that's what, uh, I guess, a, a good first go at saying what a meta language is, right. maybe we also need to talk about why we need to talk about the ways we talk about the other things that we're talking about. So a, why we talk about, so a, a language about why we talk about how we talk about things, a meta meta language. Yeah. Ironically yeah. enough. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so... Is it meta-meta? I mean, well, maybe right. just meta just means meta, any level once above you go, Once you're above the object language, it doesn't matter how many... Uh, you might even say, like, look, nested meta-languages are really just... Just so long as they are capable of being integrated, uh, that's enough. So... Um, one thought is that, look, we speak meta-languages all the time. We talk about rhymes. That's, again, a language about language, right? So whenever, whenever we talk about rhyme schemes or stanzas in poems and things like that, or a paragraph, uh, or even the notion of a sentence, uh, we are, you might say, not talking about the things we're talking about, dogs and cats and economies and cups. Uh, we're talking about the language we use to talk about dogs and cats and economies and cups. Um, and so we, so the notion of a rhyme it requires a meta-language, that you're just looking at the words, and we have vocabularies for that. The, no, the vocabulary of grammar is a meta-language, noun-verb agreements. So the, we're not looking at, again, when we, the notion of noun is about words that are about cups and economies and things like dogs and cats, cups and economies. But, they're, but it's a way for us to be able to identify how we're using the words. And in all these cases, the use of the meta-languages are in order for us to be able to call attention to how to properly and identify improper uses of the object language. So whenever we say, look, we've got a failure of uh, noun-verb disagreement in a sentence, or that stanza didn't rhyme with the end of the last one, right? The rhyme scheme is off or something like that. We have a way of being able to identify when things have gone wrong, and we have a way of articulating some rules for how things work. Logic works the same way, right? It's a meta-language about how reasons fit together, and some rules about how they're supposed to fit together, and also some names for whenever they fail to. So that's, you might say, that's what fallacies are. The all those fallacy terms are not terms about things in the world. 
they're terms for whenever it looks like we're reasoning and they don't fit together, the reasons don't fit together in the right way for us to be able to get to the conclusion. Right, and so that's why a proposed argument, proposed inference, comprised of all true statements at the object level can still manifest a fallacy. Right. Because they don't fit the right kind of form or they don't provide the kind of support to be able to... So even if they are all true premises and true conclusions, yep. right? You just say a bunch of true stuff and a therefore in between some of it, it could still be a terrible argument. Right. And in order, in order to get that... Yeah, yeah it still right. be a, right. It could still be a fallacious and not good argument. Right. Why? Well, because those things just don't fit together, right? So you could even right. say someone's a terrible a reporter about a, a, about politics and the person's a drunk, but you infer the fact that the person's a bad a reporter about politics because they're a drunk. Well, that's not that's not a good reason. That's not a good reason, right? Those are all true things, but the relationship between there, the, the therefore connection, isn't necessarily a good one. Right. Why? Because knowing things about politics might drive you to drink. <laughs> um uh and but not all so one obvious kind of meta language um is a kind of meta language that relies on a form content distinction yes so the logic uh the meta language of logic is a form content right. uh meta language the log, meta log, the meta language of grammar is a form content Right? right. It doesn't matter what the sentences are about. We're right. talking about nouns and verbs and parts of speech of other kinds and phrases and the way all those interlock and how they have to line up to make for proper grammaticality. Right. Um, that's all about the what we might call sort of the the syntactic uh, feature, the the form Good. of of the sentence. But not all meta languages, I take it, right, are. Um, can be assimilated or, or just instances of or callings attentions to form content distinctions. Right. So, yeah, the semantic, you might call it semantic syntax distinction or something along those lines, right. it looks like is, is part of it. And right, formal logic definitely depends on you being able to just say something like, look, I can distinguish validity from, like the distinction between validity and soundness is even, looks like it depends on that requirement that the form of the reasoning guarantees that if the premises are true, the conclusion's right. false, just because it, and it doesn't matter what they're about. Um, but it does look like with regards to reasoning in a more robust sense, in this dialectical sense, it looks like we need to be paying attention to something more than just form, right? Uh, and so often whenever we talk about meaning or whenever we talk about uh, the, way that, the way that our sentences are able to hook up with things and to be able to have significance, we talk about them having uh, a syntax and being able to fit together internally as sentences and also uh, across sentences as, as sets of formal inferences. We talk about their semantics, whether or not they're true or false, what they're about. But we also talk about pragmatics, right? right. We talk about the fact that um, we are often responding to. So whenever I say, for example, um, whenever I say, for example, uh, um, it's cold in here, right? I might also be, I might be, my, the semantics of it is just I'm making an observation about the room. But for example, if I were to utter it, uh, uh, utter it to um, somebody who's in a position to be able to turn up the heat, I might actually be asking them to turn up the heat, right? So it doesn't just have the semantics of whether or not it's true or false. It can have a certain kind of force of asking somebody to do something. Right, and it goes the other way too. Sometimes by means of asking a gr grammatically or syntactically a question, you could be giving a directive, That's right. insinuating, Right. Accusing. <laughs> Do you know that you're stepping on my toe? Right, which often means stop stepping yeah, on my get toe. Off. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, um, good. Um, now it looks as if, um, when it comes to popular political discourse, especially these days, what we've been witnessing, I think, uh, over the past year or more, is a kind of um, proliferation of second order political concepts, right? We've, we've been witnessing a, um, uh, a very rapid growth or development of our, pol our, of our political meta language. That is a language that we deploy to talk about how people are talking about politics. This is why a term like post-truth or alternate facts. Or alternate facts. Or fake news. Right. Right? The, to say that something is fake news 
isn't simply to say that something has been reported and it's false, right? Fake news is not simply false reportage. Right. Fake news is calling attention to what? The dissimulation. Some a systematic, kind of intentional right. way of presenting a distorted picture of political events and political states of affairs um, for the sake of what? Distorting somebody's political thinking on the first order, right? right? As and by and calling it news, right? Right. Right. I mean, in some ways, you're right. Whenever you call it fake news, you're putting the scare quotes around news, right? Um, and notice, by the way, that now it's just now it's just being used. So again, uh, Donald Trump in his first uh, um, uh, press conference used the expression as a way of discrediting CNN and saying you don't get to ask a question at the uh, 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 to me, and I'm not going to answer them, uh, and saying no, you're fake news, and you don't get to ask a question. Um, this is a case where it's deployed uh, in order to make it so that you're a you're not going to that the people who at least are sympathetic to you are not going to believe the things that they say, and also make it so that they don't even get to make the reports, right? They don't even get to ask the questions or collect evidence. What was odd about that particular episode was uh, um, I I found out about Donald Trump calling the reporter from CNN uh, were, uh, saying that CNN was a fake news source. I saw that on CNN. <laughs> well, so the, there's something there's something sort of deliciously meta about that, right? Where they are, re because of their relationship with Donald Trump, Donald Trump calling them fake news is in some ways... News! News! <laughs> Not fake. Right, that right. Part's and news. right, we're, we are reporting that he said this, and him <laughs> saying it is... Right, so that's not fake news. It should be a kind of pop to that balloon in a way. Um, yeah, I don't think it worked that way, but... Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, it, it, by the way, if, it, so we move very quickly, I think, right. from uh, talking from talking about or trying to elucidate the concept of a meta language to then some issues about the way meta languages, when their meta languages specifically about political talk, have entered into our everyday vernacular, and we've given some cases. Um, uh, is is the is the Seinfeld TV show all about meta? It's a show about nothing, and so it's nothing. <laughs> that's or is it a show? Is it maybe it's a it's show a, about itself? It's, but the show right, is about it's, nothing. It's a nothing, right? Yeah. Uh, it, well, it seems to be a sort of a, uh, the analysis of not events, but the micro norms that are around the events. Yeah. So the close talking things yeah, and yeah, things yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah, well. um, but notice, by the way, that the vocabulary of the, this meta language vocabulary has been around for a long time. We again, people have called the things that others are saying mere rhetoric. That's another right. way of coming up. We've got the term propaganda. Uh, we've got we've got a lot of these sort of the double no, speak, double speak, right? Uh, we've speak. Got spin is another one. New yeah. speak is a great yeah. one. Um, and so these vocabularies have been around, right? And so uh, invoking 1984, this is something that's not a yeah. new phenomenon. Yeah, in fact, calling um, something Orwellian or right. Kafkaesque, right. Good. these are second-order judgments about, well, in the, particularly in the Orwellian case, about the case of the, the term Orwellian, about ways of talking. Kafkaesque is more about situations it, and things, it right. seems to me, right? That's right, yeah. Um, yeah. So, but notice now the the important thing is that is is to again make the observation that the whole point of developing a meta language is for you to have a kind of neutral vocabulary to be able to make assessments and evaluate the things that are happening in the object language. Yeah. You should be able to criticize even somebody who on the first on order, your side. Yeah, you should be able to say the content of what you said is true, but you're still criticizable given some other feature of your asserting that it. That doesn't make, have anything yeah. to do with what we agree on. Right. It, it just has to do with the way that you've argued. Notice, however, that now it's, you might say, meta-languages have become weaponized. Yeah. Yeah. With that happy thought, 
That's Philosophy 15, folks. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you next time.